Welcome to this first Cambridge Community Conversation for 2021. I'm Mike Starling. My thanks to the collaborating partners in the Cambridge Community Conversation. That's the Cambridge Association of Neighborhoods, the Dorchester Chamber of Commerce, the Dorchester Star, as well as, of course, WHCP Radio, whose studios we are again utilizing uh, tonight in a socially distanced arrangement. So our on-screen presenters are in separate studios, as am I, and the folks in the control room are all masked and more than six feet separate. We are again grateful to the Dorchester County Health Department for taking time of an already grueling schedule, managing and administering COVID tests, vaccinations, contact tracing, et cetera, et cetera. Now you may ask your questions tonight and the chat function, we will do our best to get to as many as possible. The questions are many, and so I think we should get right to our experts. Roger Harrell, our County Health Officer, and Dr. Casey Scott, the Deputy Director. So Roger, would you start us off and then hand over to Dr. Scott? Yes, thank you very much, Mike, and thank WHCP and all your partnering agencies who put this uh, program together to share with the community. Thank you for your leadership in establishing WHCP. It's been a, a godsend to us in, in Cambridge. Uh, we've been here, this will be our third time. Uh, a lot has happened since the last time we were here. We came in, uh, in uh, August and to give you just some perspective, we had 463 positive cases as, as of that date. As of today, the 26th of January, we're over 2,000 cases. So the caseload has picked up. And you might remember we shared with the community, we were ramping up testing because we needed, as part of the medication factors, we needed to find those individuals that were positive. We needed to isolate them, quarantine their contacts. And, and that was one way we would wrap our hands around COVID-19. Uh, we've done such a great job. We went through the holidays. We had some peaks. We thought at Thanksgiving time, we asked the community to think about not having large Thanksgiving gatherings within your home. Can't try to keep the numbers of folks to your immediate family, say 10 or less. And we're not sure that society in general did all that, although we didn't see the numbers pop with positivity until, uh, Jan until uh, uh, December. And the numbers in jumped off the the, the, uh, the uh, map in December. We had 357 cases, 342 cases that month alone. January, I hate to tell you, is go we're going to probably, we're going to double that. As of today, we have 558 cases and we still got cases coming in. So some things that worked, uh, uh, the good news is, and Dr. Scott's going to address this uh, when she uh, has opening remarks, is the last time we were here, we didn't have a vaccine. Well, we have a vaccine now but we don't have the adequate supply. It gives us another tool in that toolbox. We always said it previously, we had to practice good public health, wash your good hand hygiene, wear face coverings uh, uh, when you can't stay within six feet inside and uh, when appropriate outside, and uh, keep your social distance of six foot, which Mike referenced that we have in the studio tonight. We do have another we have the tool, in the tool in the toolbox and it is the vaccine. Uh, and while we have that, it's the same team at the health department that's putting the shots in the arms. And so going forward, starting in February, we'll only be testing one day a week because our focus will be as our, our supply of vaccine increases, our focus will be getting shots in the arms. So with that, uh, Dr. Scott, I'll call, uh, pass off to you for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much. So, yes, yeah, so the last time we were here, we weren't yet even discussing a vaccine. I think we may talk, had talked a little bit about what those clinical trials were looking like and, and how those clinical trials were being done. But um, I have a little bit of our vaccine data and our statistics on what we've been able to distribute thus far. So we got our first shipment of vaccine on December 23rd, or so right before the Christmas holiday. Um, we had a... Um, our very first clinic was on December 29th. We vaccinated 32 people on that day. Since then, we've been able to ramp up our efforts. Um, we had our largest clinic to date on the 21st of this month. We vaccinated 245 folks. Since then, unfortunately, we've had to cut back a little bit. We were a little vigorous on our efforts, uh, more vigorous than we were able to receive vaccine supply, unfortunately. So while we are ready and able to vaccinate um, many folks per day, we are quite limited in how many per week we can even vaccinate right now. So right now, um, our focus is 
uh, those that are in 1A that still have yet to be vaccinated, which is healthcare workers, frontline um, first responders, uh, those in 1B, which are our individuals 75 and older. Um, and while the state has opened uh, eligibility to folks in 1C, we uh, are not able to offer vaccine at this time to that priority group simply because of supply. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. And I think we'll we'll kind of work through all of the logistics of what these clinics are looking like and then hopefully answer some questions with the questions that are um, forthcoming. Okay, so um, let's go to our questions. And uh, we've got a team in the uh, control room, our question analyst. Uh, here's someone that says they filled out a vaccine request but did not get an acknowledgement, uh, do they need to fill out another form? Should there be an acknowledgement, I guess, is the, the basic question there. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, do not fill out another form. Um, I think early on, there was not a message that automa automatically showed up on the screen when you filled it out. That should have been remedied by now. So now when you submit the form, it should say your response has been submitted. Please await further instructions. Um, that form, if for anybody who's not aware of what we're talking about, if you go to our uh, Dorchester County Health Department website, it's dorchesterhealth.org. On the home screen, there's a blue box that has all of our COVID information, and there is a link there uh, for a COVID-19 uh, vaccine interest form. So it's for people who want the vaccine um, when we are able to offer a appointment. It is not how you make an appointment. It is basically how you get on our waiting list. Um, I'll tell you, we've had many, 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 many people <laughs> fill this uh, vaccine form out, which is great. Um, but we are a little bit delayed in how we can get you an appointment because we don't have enough vaccine to get everybody scheduled right now. OK, um, so no, don't submit another form. Um, if you filled it out and it says your response was submitted, then we have it and we have you in the queue and we will contact you shortly. OK, good to know. Our next question is. Is coming right up. <laughs> Stay tuned. There it is. How can I get transportation to a site? I don't drive or have anyone to help me. What do you think, Case? You want that one? Your <laughs> sure. <laughs> so this this is a problem we know, um, and we have a solution. Um, it's just not quite ready yet. So um, as part of the uh, CARES Act, with some of the funding that we were able to secure, we have ordered two vans that are being outfitted as sort of like mobile clinics. Um, we're hoping to have those in our possession shortly, um, but they are meant for us to pack up a vaccination mm -hmm team, pack up our vaccine and go to some of the remote areas of the county where we know transportation is an issue. Um, I don't have a timeline exactly on that right now, but I do know the whole purpose of getting these vans was for this exact reason. So we know that it, for public health and for um, a local health department, it is entirely our responsibility to make sure that people who want the vaccine but who can't get to us to make sure that we can get to you. Um, so if you're going to fill out that vaccine interest form, there is a box that says additional comments please let us know if you might fall into that category where transportation would be an issue because that will help us determine mm -hmm. next steps as we uh, do acquire those vans. Yeah. Uh, I would add to that, Mike, I think transportation in general in the rural area is an issue uh, and there's not adequate transportation even oftentimes to get uh, individuals to medical appointments. And uh, year, in years past, we had used to have uh, years ago a well well mobile and we went out into the community. We did some on-site uh, visits with individuals. And what Dr. Scott is talking about is the two vans, the two new vans we purchased will be able to use that. The other thing that uh, we can look at uh, is with the churches and in communities to find volunteers to drive folks. Uh, and I think Dr. Scott, we talked about homebound as well. Uh, we're not, we don't think that home health agencies are actually, they don't have, are given the vaccine, we don't think. And that's another category we need to think about. So uh, let us know if you feel like, she, as Dr. Scott said on the forum, uh, you need transportation. And then when we get to that, we'll use some of our staff to see what we can do to get you to, to, to us or get to you. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Sounds like uh, active planning is underway there. Um, so if I'm not a Dorchester County resident, but I'm living here temporarily, 
Can I still get a vaccine here? Yes. Okay, that was easy. So <laughs> no discrimination yeah. just because you're not right. from our county. And I, right. is that going to be true pretty much across the state? Yeah, that's Roger, true. That, and what they will have to do, it, if they're living here uh, temporarily, they're in the county, they would have to fall within the categories of where we are. Right now, they would have to be in, in the 1C category, 75 plus, et cetera. So there's a caveat to that. I think our intent is to vaccinate all comers as long as we have the appropriate amount of vaccine. And right now, we do not have that. So we're prioritizing who we're going to be vaccinating. So even if I'm one of those classic weekenders, uh, hopefully once you've got plenty of vaccine, uh, that won't be an issue. Uh, say, sure, come on in. You're here and you're next up in line. Come on in. Yeah. Well, we'd love to get to the same thing we were able to do with our testing because we had a lot of test kits. We tested a lot of folks that either came into Dorchester County. Actually, we had some would be stop at McDonald's when we were testing at the health department and come on over and get a test. <laughs> so, uh, we'd like to get back to that, but we're not there yet. We don't have the vaccine. I know, I know some people that were driving by and said, oh, the line is short. I'm pulling in right now. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think that just speaks to the the sort of message that we want to get out is that um, in public health, our, our job is to make things accessible. Um, and so we didn't want to place any unnecessary restrictions on folks, um, especially with testing, when testing was such a needed service. Um, you know, that's why we don't require appointments and we don't require insurance. And um, it's it's, it's a service that that it's our responsibility to offer. Um, and we really hope that we get there with the vaccines. We're just not quite there. So I wonder if that'll also apply if I'm a government worker or in the military. Should I be depending on the federal pipeline to provide my vaccine or is it um, no distinctions necessary wherever you can get it first? Well, I would say where you can get it first also. But if you're like, if you uh, work at a at, at, down at, at uh at a federal operation here in, in the county. If you work in this county and you qualify under one of the categories, we'll be happy to do the vaccination for you as well as a, you have to work or live here. Okay. I would right. say one, I'm going to add, add something to that. Um, whatever, there's two vaccines on the market right now. So there's one made uh, by Pfizer and there's one made by Moderna. You have to get the same vaccine for both yeah. of your doses. So, um, you know, while you could get a Moderna vaccine at our health department and then your second at another health department, theoretically, you have to just make sure that one, you know where you'll get your second dose and two, that it's going to be the same vaccine that was your first dose. Yep. That's a, that's a key point, Dr. Scott, that they need to know that. And ideally would be that that they would come back. If we did them, they'd come back to us with Moderna. But you need to. There are some of that, as Dr. Scott pointed out, to always make sure you're getting the same vaccine as you had before. Right. Okay. Here's uh, someone that wrote in and said, will there be a guarantee of a reservation of a second dose once the first dose is given? Dr. Scott. So we've been, we've been told by the state health department that yes, they are going to uh, provide us with second dose vaccines for those folks that we give their first dose. Um, I will tell everybody that if you're going to another location to get your first dose, that is a very important question to ask mm -hmm. um, because we've certainly heard otherwise. But um, as, as far as our site and our clinic operation, that is the case. Okay. All right. Good to know. Now, what proof do I need to show that I'm uh, in any particular category uh, or, or might have a special condition that puts me in a, a higher eligibility uh, category? The, ba the basic, we're not asking for a lot of information. If you're a government worker, you probably have an ID and we can see that. But we want those that have uh, such as di diabetics, asthmatics. We're not going to ask that the doctor send a, a, uh, a uh, appointment slip with them that they start certifying that. We ask that individuals uh, to, use, uh, to, to, to use their own integrity and be honest and we're going to trust you. We don't have any reason. Otherwise, it just that begins to slow the process down. Uh, it comes down to uh, individual behavior and doing it the right way. And so uh, Dr. Scott and I have had the conversation with the team, and I don't know if Dr. Scott has anything she'd like to offer or not. I think that just provides an additional unnecessary barrier. Yeah. We're doing our best to make sure that we're offering appointment slots to those who are in the proper prioritization categories. Um, 
I think uh, it's important that, you know, we're going to believe what you say. So be truthful, please. Um, and and we realize that there's a lot of people looking for vaccine. There's a lot of people trying to get on wait lists on, in different locations. So if you end up getting a vaccine and you know that you have an appointment with us, let us know so we can cancel it and give someone else your spot. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I love the fact that you guys are just clearing all that bureaucracy out of the way and saying, we'll get you in here. Just tell us what the right order is and, and be honest about uh, what category you're in. So I assume the answer to this next question, do I need to bring any medical insurance information is no, you don't. Hmm. Is that correct? Yes and no. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes and no. I'm glad we asked. So we do ask if you have in your insurance card that you bring it. So I, I want to be clear, the vaccine itself is free. You don't get charged for the vaccine. Um, we have been asked to collect insurance information to bill for a vaccine administration fee. Oh. Um, I do want to make clear, however, that your insurance status will not be a barrier to getting a vaccine. So if you don't have your vaccination, if you don't have your insurance card with you, and you have an appointment, still come. If you don't have insurance at all, please still come. So that is in no way meant to be a barrier. Um, it is simply an instruction that we are trying to follow. Okay, that makes sense that um, uh, reimbursement uh, exchanges, I guess, between the government and the insurance companies uh, take place where it's appropriate. So if I have COVID, when my appointment comes up, do they just shift me by 10 days? Or do I get pushed all the way back to the end of the line? There's a lot to unpack with this question. So I'll start out. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about if you have COVID. Um, the qu one question we get a lot is, if I've had COVID, do I still need a vaccine? And if I still want the vaccine, when should I come get it? So um, number one, just like this question infers, you you should not be coming to get a vaccine if you're currently on isolation or quarantine. OK, so if you're a contact of someone or if you have been diagnosed with covid, um, we will not let you in the door because we screen for those things. We're trying to protect our staff and, and everyone else coming for a vaccine. Um, now, if you're if you've been cleared from isolation or quarantine and let's say that you're someone who tested positive for covid, um, you are are eligible for vaccination. The CDC has provided some guidance that uh, you have an option to wait for a period of 90 days yeah. from the time of your diagnosis. And that's because uh, similarly to the guidance that we provide um, when we do contact tracing, it, it's thought to be really, really a low likelihood of getting a, a reinfection from COVID in those first 90 days. And in all reality, it's prob probably longer. Um, so for those people who, um, have had COVID, you can come get your vaccine as long as you're off of isolation, um, but you do have that option to wait the 90 days. And, and what we are seeing is for some folks who have had COVID and who have come through and gotten their first dose of a vaccine, um, their immune system is a little bit primed. And so they do have some of those adverse reactions, some of those fevers and chills and, and body aches and things that we typically see with the second dose. Um, they might get that more likely with their first dose. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the of the conversation. Um, the second part of that is if you have to move your appointment, do you get pushed to the end of the line? No, but I am asking and pleading with everyone. It is not the easiest system to reschedule folks for appointments. Um, so please treat the appointment as a priority. Um, obviously, we know things come up, but it is not as simple as being able to just trade with someone else or, you know, oh, I'll send my wife instead. We can't do that. That registration, we ask clinical questions to make sure that it's appropriate that you even get the vaccine. And if we need to reschedule, we have to redo that whole registration process over again. Um, so, no, you would not get pushed to the end of the line. Um, we would at this point, it would be hard for us to find an appointment for you because we're pretty booked. Um, so do everything you can to try to keep your yeah. vaccine appointments. And if I would comment on that as well, I think, uh, Casey, as we're going through this now, we pull down the online registration for second appointments uh, and we're doing that manually. We beefed, beefed the staff up in the call center to be able to call individuals because our online system had a few hiccups and glitches. So we're doing that. Uh, on the, uh, through phone calls. And so bear with us if you're waiting on your, uh, you know, you've already had your first uh, vaccine and you're waiting for that appointment. Uh, we will be in, in touch with you. 
All right. Well, that sounds good. Thanks for the thorough answer. Now, if I had a reaction to the first dose, should I go ahead and get the second one? Good clinical question. We know that who that goes for. <laughs> <laughs> um, I th it, it depends on the reaction, quite honestly. So um, when we look at vaccine reactions, uh, we are considering those that happen immediately versus those that are delayed. So for those, and, and this was recent guidance that came from the state health department, for anyone who had an immediate reaction, no matter how severe it was, so rash, um, hives or whatnot, um, and by immediate, we mean within those first 30 minutes, it is not recommended that you receive a second dose. Now we have had several people who have had um, itching or redness about a week after their first vaccine, and that is not considered in the same category of reactions. So those people are eligible to get their second dose. Um, if you have any questions about any sort of reaction that you may have had, you can feel free to call the health department. They will direct that to me, um, but also feel free to reach out to your primary care physician. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, here's a Susan Kleiss uh, writing in, for those who get a first shot, are you making specific appointments for the second uh, vaccine before the, um, they can leave after getting the first shot? Is that all done at the same time? It is. And I think we've got a really good system worked out. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, we moved our, our initial vaccine clinic was at the health department in a pretty yeah. small conference room that we have. Um, and we were having folks, uh, once they left the conference room, they would go outside, make their second dose appointment with one of our registration folks, and then sort of do their monitoring in their car or standing outside waiting for their timer to go off. Um, and that's a requirement that we we have of everybody that they have to wait at least 15 minutes after the uh, vaccine is given. And that's actually something we do with any injectable medication we give at the health department. Um, if you've had a uh, severe allergic reaction in the past, we ask that you wait 30 minutes. So that's a little tidbit. But we've since moved our location to one of the ballrooms at the Hyatt. Um, in a partnership with with um, with them, which has been great. And so we have more space now. And so what happens is, is you 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 come in and you uh, we make sure that you know your appointment is for that time and that day. We get your insurance information. You go to one of the nurse vaccination stations, get your vaccine, um, and then immediately then, you know, your 15 minutes of your wait time starts, but you proceed to the registration area um, to make your appointment. So by the time you're done making your appointment, a lot of your wait time is already gone. Um, and, and we have, um, we make sure that you know, for the Moderna vaccine, we, it, it's ideal that your doses are 28 days apart. There's a little bit of flex space there, but but that's really what was studied in the clinical trials was 28 days apart. And so that's really the efficacy that we want to try to give you. Um, so we make sure that there's enough appointments on that day and that you leave that day knowing when you're coming back. Yeah. And then the registration system sends you a appointment reminder the night before your next your next vaccine appointment. So not to confuse that with the statement I just made earlier, I'm talking about that first group of individuals who were going online. We've had some of that where we've had to go back manually, call them, and there may be still some there. I'm not sure as of this afternoon, Casey, whether we've called all those that had their second appointments in the next couple of weeks. So we did have a group, a small group of folks, uh, Dr. Scott and that team has put together the system as she just described, and that, that has, that's fail safe. That one there, you, you're you doing it right there. The staff's doing the appointment for you and you're not having to go back and go into a link and do it yourself because that's what I had to do with mine because I, I was there under the old system. Yeah. So and clarification. We had a couple times, um, I believe the January 15th clinic, if any of you are listening, um, where the system went down. So we actually, okay. we knew we were going to have to call people ahead of time, but um you know, the, the good thing about the online registration system is that it's easy for us to run reports so we know who was vaccinated on a certain day and we can see if yeah. you have an upcoming appointment. Um, and, you know, if, if you're concerned that they're in an improper amount of time apart, um, we can get you rescheduled. Have you had, uh, this isn't one of the scripted questions, but I'll, I'll jump in and it prompts me to think, have you had many uh, instances of people with a reaction um, after getting the vaccine or has it uh, been a pretty small number? Everybody, like I said, everybody waits the 15 to 30 minutes. Um, we have a fully stocked emergency kit there and, and able to respond. Um, and 
we've not had to use any medications or anything like that. I mean, we've certainly, um, like I said, I, we've had a few uh, people that we work with who reported rash or whatnot, um, maybe about a week later. Um, but I will say there is a system called vSafe that we promote while uh, as part of the education piece while you're waiting for your vaccine. And that's a way to um, basically sign up for these automated text messages that will allow you to report any side effect that you are experiencing directly to the CDC. And so it sends you, um, I, I just got my second shot yesterday and I, I registered for it while I was sitting and waiting. And it gives me a notification um, and a link. And I click on it and it asks, how are you feeling today? And you say fair, good or bad. And then it asks you specifically what what symptoms you're having. And did that interfere with your ability to go to work or to did you have to go see your doctor? And so that's a way that the CDC is, is constantly monitoring the safety data um, while in real time people are getting the vaccine. But no, we, we've not had to respond to anybody um, having any sort of adverse allergic reaction. Good. Um, so I think we've already answered this one about uh, staying for 15 minutes uh, and 30 minutes if you had reactions to injections before, right? Yes. So 15 minutes is standard for everyone. Um, and then the 30 minutes is if you've had um, a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis, and that's to anything. So that could be food or another vaccine or um, any other injectable medication. And anaphylaxis would be constricted airway? So anaphylaxis is a systemic severe um, response to, to something that you're allergic to, and, and it can be deadly. So it's, it's something that is important to, to monitor for. Okay. Uh, are arrangements being made to vaccinate husbands and wives together to ease transportation challenges? <laughs> Or for any other reason? <laughs> sure. I mean, we, we're, we're doing everything we can to make it yeah. easy for folks. Um, so a lot of times what happens is husbands and wives will make their first appointment together. Um, and, and if they haven't, um, let's say we had a couple instances where one spouse was a couple days before the other spouse. And instead of scheduling that first spouse at the time of that appointment, we waited to schedule them until the second spouse was done. Um, there is a grace period of four days. So 28 days is the ideal time. We can give the vaccines as close together as 24 days. Um, and so we have a little bit of wiggle room there. So we do our best. We want to try and get it to 28 days apart. So we wouldn't want to compromise the efficacy of the vaccine just to make it more convenient. But we can certainly, we have some um, flexibility in our scheduling system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the only caveat I would add to that, uh, Dr. Scott is absolutely correct. But uh, if right now, if, if we're deal doing 75 and older, and if you have a couple where the wife is 73 and the, and the husband's 75, uh, we, we're not doing the 73. And that's where we have to explain to them. Otherwise, we try to do is exactly as Dr. Scott said. We get plenty of vaccine. That is not an issue. So keep in mind, once we have plenty of vaccine, we can very well easily work, figure out how to do that. So. You might hear there are some folks even today where we had to uh, not, we scheduled the one spouse, but couldn't schedule the other. Well, That's we're all looking point. forward to the day that there's plenty of vaccine, mm -hmm. hopefully soon. So here's someone with a hypothetical. Say my wife and I uh, get our second vaccinations three weeks ago and another couple got theirs <laughs> at the same time. Can we now visit together without mask and dis distancing and have no fear of contracting COVID? <laughs> Dr. Scott. No. <laughs> the answer is N O. N O. So, so here's why, and specifically in this scenario, here's why. So the vaccines that are available right now, um, the efficacy of these vaccines are very high, 94 to 95% effective against preventing um, severe COVID-19 illness. Okay. But they are 94 to 95% efficacious with two doses given either 21 or 28 days apart, depending on which vaccine we're talking about. Um, and then even after you've gotten your second dose, full immunity isn't really realized until um, one week after getting the Pfizer vaccine or two weeks after getting the Moderna vaccine. So, you know, I got my second dose yesterday. That doesn't mean that I um, couldn't get COVID tomorrow. 
right? So I think it's important to remember that our bodies take a little bit of time to react to this and to really build that proper immune response that we can trust. And until we have a significant proportion of our population that we consider immune, um, we're going to have to continue to mask and social distance until, until we reach that. Well, that's an important clarification. Thank you very much. Um, what medical conditions make it advisable for me to contact my primary care physician or a family doctor prior to getting vaccinated? So as a former primary care physician and family doctor myself, um, you know, your primary care physician is uh, the best expert uh, to, to contact if you have specific questions about your individual risks or your um, any specific questions about your medical conditions and whatnot. Um, you know, we can certainly provide some general information about the vaccine, but while I am a family doctor, I am not your family doctor. Um, and I certainly can't provide on the site medical consultation for your specific needs. Um, I will say more in, more specifically, if you have a history of allergy or if you get allergy shots or you get other sorts of infusions or things like that, um, if you're currently in treatment for cancer, um, I think all of these are good things to talk with your specialist or your primary care doctor about before you make the decision. It's just important, you know, getting a vaccine is a medical decision that uh, deserves a lot of attention. Um, and it's important to make sure that you're asking the right questions to the right people. I want to back up to a question that you actually uh, answered uh, in conversation with Pete Doyle that we run here on Midshore Midday. And I think it was an important one that probably bears repeating to that uh, tonight. And, and that is uh, the mRNA uh, vaccines are inherently safe because? Yeah. There's very little thing in the vaccine. So um, there's very few ingredients for one. Um, the ingredients really are uh, the mRNA itself, which is basically a message that is sent to the cells in our muscle when we get the injection that tells our cells how to make um, something called the spike protein, which is found on the outside of the coronavirus particle. And so once our cells know how to make that, our immune cells that circulate around in our body can see that. And they're always sort of trying to figure out, is this me or is this something foreign? And if it's something foreign, I'm going to start uh, reacting to it. And so that's really how it builds this immune response. Now, that mRNA particle is pretty short lived. It doesn't stay around in our bodies very long. And that's kind of why these vaccines um, have such stringent um, uh, refrigeration and, and freezer uh, requirements because it's a pretty delicate uh, thing. So it sort of degrades. And then what we're left with are the instructions for how to defeat the virus. Um, other than that, um, what's in the um, them is some lipids that help sort of, you know, protect this mRNA, sucrose and polyethylene glycol, which is the active ingredient in Miralax, or if someone's ever had a bowel prep for a colonoscopy, you've probably had that before. Um, and that's it. Those are the ingredients that are in it. Um, so so that that is why, one of the main reasons why they're considered so safe. So it's not a low dose of uh, COVID itself that you're being given, which is what I think some people misunderstood and were worried about. Mm -hmm. No, there's, there's no COVID at all. There's no way to that you could get COVID from the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of a lot of vaccines um, that you might have been familiar with or that you may have received in the past have either a very small dose of a live virus or a killed virus. So it's basically presenting a little bit of the virus to your body, but enough that your body doesn't get infected, but that can react to it. Um, this works in a very different way. So there's no no bit of the COVID virus in it. It's basically the instructions for how to make and recognize the part of the COVID virus that allows it to infect us. All right, great. Thanks so much for that. I think that's really important information for everyone to have as a baseline. So someone in my family is very reluctant to get vaccinated. Are there any resources in print or in person ca that can help to educate them that I can share? you have anything that we should point them to? So, basically, 
Yeah, other than your last uh, <laughs> answer, <laughs> record this well, and play it back. You know, I think I think it is important to remember that just like any health decision, this is completely voluntary. This is something that um, everyone has to consider their risk and benefit ratio for this. Just like when you take a Tylenol or you decide to have surgery, you know, this is a health decision. Um, and if someone's hesitant, hesitant about that, it, we're not here to coerce them into getting something. We're here to help provide them with the information that they need to make the best decision for them. Um, so I will point people to um, the state health department website. It's COVID link dot maryland dot gov um, and there's a link to that on our web page as well but there's a lot of um, links from that page to cdc resources and other reputable resources where people can learn more about what to expect after i get the vaccine mm -hmm. you know am i going to have a fever do i need to take a day off of work what is it going to feel like um, and also, certainly, if you know which vaccine that you might be getting, if you're coming to our health department, it would be the Moderna vaccine. You can go to the Moderna website and you can read about the patient safety data there. Um, anytime you, you register for a vaccine, um, we're going to provide you with um, basically a six page document that talks mm -hmm. about the ingredients, the risks, the side effects, this, the, the pros and the cons. And that can be really, really sciencey and overwhelming to look at. And so some of these other resources are there to help supplement that so that it you can get the information that you need without um, having to dive too deep into all of this technical jargon. Okay. Uh, COVIDlink.maryland spelled out, right? Maryland. Yes. Mm -hmm. COVIDlink.maryland.gov. Great. If I don't get the second shot, am I still protected? Can I actually skip the second one? Well, no. <laughs> so what I will say, so, so you know, the, the data that we have about the efficacy of these vaccines is based on the clinical trials. And in the clinical trials, uh, people that were vaccinated received two doses 28 days apart. And the pooled efficacy among those people was 94 to 95%. Okay. That doesn't mean that one dose gives you 0% protection, but it just means that we don't really know exactly what one dose gives you. And that's not how it was studied, right? Um, so it's not recommended that you skip the second one unless you have a reason to skip the second one. Some of those adverse reactions that we spoke about, um, so, you know, this is going to be individualized too. everyone's immune system will react differently. Everyone has their own uh, level of immunity. So those of us who um, are not immunocompromised are going to probably mount a better immune response to the vaccine than those of us that are immunocompromised. Um, but what we what we can claim from the clinical trials is that two doses, 28 days apart, will give us about mm -hmm. 94 to 95 percent efficacy against coronavirus. OK, great. All right. Thanks for that. I, I, I appreciate that explanation. Can I sign up and then designate someone else to take my plates in line? I bet I know the answer to this one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to plead with you to not do this. <laughs> I, wish it, I wish it were easy. I really wish that that registration process were easier. And um, unfortunately, the system that we're using is something that we have to use. Um, but, you know, it's not like going to your doctor's office where you and your wife have appointments at 3 and 3.15 and you just want to switch spots. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that. Um, and that's because each registration, again, we're asking you for specific clinical information, uh, basically a screening questionnaire to determine if you're eligible to receive the vaccine. And then we have to go over that with you when you arrive, and we answer any questions that you have. So, um, and even if let's say you're registered for a vaccine appointment tomorrow and you wanted to change it to Friday, um, it's not as simple as us going into the computer and just changing the date. We actually have to cancel the appointment and then go through that whole registration process again for the Friday yeah. appointment time. So, it's not easy for us on the back end. Um, and because we're so, we have to be so strict with the priority groups because of the limited supply. Um, I'm asking that you don't give anybody your, your space in line. And if you were given a registration link, please don't share mm -hmm. them either. And any hiccups like that is draining resources and time away from you guys, a small mighty team that's trying to get us all taken care of. So uh, please, uh, Follow the rules, <laughs> follow the protocol. <laughs>
All right. Is the actual vaccine administered in a private setting or is it more open? I'd sort of prefer a private setting. I'm a sensitive guy, you know, so maybe <laughs> different sites handle that differently or you tell me. So the way that our site is set up, I mentioned that it was in one of the ballrooms at the Hyatt. Um, so I would not classify that as private. Um, however, we do have some privacy screens set up um, to separate the, the nurse vaccination stations. Um, I think probably the most private setting that you will that you will get would be in your private doctor's office, but they are not receiving vaccines as of yet. So I'm not sure how long you might have to wait for a very private setting. Um, we do ask that when you make an appointment and you come that you wear a short sleeve shirt so you don't have to completely undress um, in the ballroom. And that does help. Um, but we can certainly, you know, it, you're not out in the open. Um, there are stations and areas for each thing. Um, but because we're doing this in a mass way, um, it's not going to be extremely private. If you have questions that you'd like to ask in private, we can certainly make that happen. And, and while uh Dr. Scott mentioned uh, the Hyde. I want to give a shout out to Hyde as a community partner who's working with us and come to came to us and they had, and offered up uh, the ballroom. Plus, we're going to use another one of their facilities because you know we don't have a lot of places in Cambridge to do these mass vaccinations. Uh, other than maybe sale wins, but kudos to to Joel and to that team because when they came here back in. Uh, at 1999, Hyde made a commitment to this community and they're well deserved and they're a great partner. And I just want to recognize them because it gave us some space that was more adequate and, and allowed us to do some things that we cannot do at the health department or at Sailwind. So kudos to Hyde. I want to recognize them. Amen. Hats off to them. We appreciate all that they're doing for the community. So here's Ray Patera asking when it states firefighters, does that mean only structural firefighters? Or do wildland firefighters qualify as well under 1B? So I we've kind of held true to this throughout all of the priority groups. Um, we're very broad in how we define people. You know, we're not going to sort of say, oh, no, only only these types of, you know, if, if you fight fires for a living, then you qualify where all the other firefighters are. Um, and that was the same with with our licensed healthcare care provider. Yeah, yeah. You know, people who work in healthcare settings counted um, because the whole idea of prioritizing people in these different occupations is because of their COVID exposure and risk. Um, so just like we're trying to, to not create any more barriers, um, we don't want to tell people no, right? We, we the, Our main goal is to get as many people vaccinated as would like to be vaccinated. And so um, by by creating the, these extraneous barriers, that certainly doesn't help us get to that end goal. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I've had COVID. I recovered completely. Does that put me in a lower priority now to get the vaccine? Uh, we touched on this a little bit already. Um, it does not change your priority in terms of when we offer you a, a shot, um, but we will talk to you about whether or not you want to wait um, that 90 mm -hmm. day period. Um, you know, it. I think a lot of it is, is talking about uh, waiting that 90 day period one so that you may have less uh, severe side effects or adverse effects after your first dose, but two, because supply is low, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're someone who's willing to wait the 90 days after your vaccine um, and allow some other vulnerable folks to get their shot, great. Um, but you're, we're not going to push you to the end of the list just because you've had COVID and recovered. If you mm -hmm. want it and you're in the priority group that can get it, you can get it. Okay. All right. Great. Good to know. Uh, here's Dan Cowell asking approximately what time frame, potential dates would the community be considered immune? What? I guess that's the community at large. I'm thinking that's herd, probably herd, 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 herd immunity. Herd immunity, Casey. <laughs> So there's a there's a bit of debate on what percentage of the population needs to be immunized or uh, have acquired innate immunity, which is when you've had COVID and then you have your own natural immunity from your infection. Um, the we're hearing, you know, anywhere from seventy to eighty percent um, recently about the percentage of a community that needs to have immunity. Um, the time frame and potential date is what's really struggling <laughs> for, for me to uh, put a time on it because, um, you know, we're, get, we're getting a couple hundred 
doses per week. Um, and mm -hmm. we have 30,000 some residents in the county. Um, so I don't know if Roger, you want to talk, uh, take this time and talk a little bit about what those numbers are and um, where we are. Yeah. Well, I, I think when you look at the current population, which is just under uh, 32,000 and one statistic that jumps off the page at you is we have 28, 2,855, uh, 75 uh, plus year uh, uh, residents. Uh, so we've got to get 70% of that 31. That's what, uh, what Casey's referring to. And it's going to depend upon how much vaccine we get, how quick we can get into the arms. And if you listen to the national news, I think they were projecting it somewhere into the summer to, to uh, late fall. Uh, and it depends on the uptake. Uh, uh, right now, we don't have a way of uh, determining what our uptake is of the population. However, when I look at the the uh, initial list that we have with those that were interested, it's got over 7,000 names on it, which tells me that's a pretty good uptake for this community. But if we don't reach the 70 percent of the 30, 31, almost 32,000 folks, then I would say we're not in that realm of the herd immunity, even though you have people that's got the 90 day. But after the 90 day, we don't know what happens there with because uh, that hasn't been studied yet in terms of the viral loads and depending where the, how long they might be uh, the immune. So it's a uh, think as we've said in the past, we learn something new every day. There's new research studies coming out. Uh, what the good news is that uh, while, I, we're, while I'm talking is that another vaccine should be coming online. We're hoping by March the 1st, Johnson and Johnson, they're close to the end of their trials. Uh, they'll put in for their emergency authorization sometime in February. And the good news there is if we can get that vaccine, it's one shot. So we don't have to worry about a second shot. So uh, it's a moving target. Uh, we're here to put shots in every arm we can find once we get the vaccine. Hopefully we'll reach that number of the uh, of the 70 percent of the local population. And one statistic that doesn't have anything to do with with herd immunity, but uh, it's projected that in every community, 10 percent of your population at one time or other should would probably test positive for COVID and we have, we're coming close, we're reaching, we're right at a little over 2000. So we got another thousand to go there. So that's an interesting statistic as well. So uh, uh, it's uh, can happen. It will happen as long as we get the vaccine and as long as we can convince the communities of some hard to reach communities where we, I'm sure we're going to be doing a lot of outreach and uh, trying to, to convince them that uh, this is a good safe vaccine, which Dr. Scott does a great job of when she talks about this. Those are all factors that will determine and having opportunities like this to talk to the community one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I think will help shorten that time frame as well. And I do have some statistics on on where we are in terms of vaccinating the community. So um, as of today, uh, Dorchester County has vaccinated 8.4 percent of its population with the first dose and one percent with a second dose. Um, and so that's among all vaccine providers in the county um, or um people in the county who have been vaccinated. So people may have been vaccinated out of the county. And then among us at the health department, we've done um, over 1,700 first doses and 29 second doses. And we've been able to distribute over 90% of our first doses that we've received. So um, it's an issue of how much we receive. <laughs> And, and so what does that mean? Uh, is the is your office uh, responsible for what percentage of the doses that have been received so far? I was trying to figure out how many people have wound up getting them elsewhere. Have you so guys right, done the vast bulk of them, I assume? Well, it, there's different um, different agencies are responsible for vaccine different populations. So um, there was a, a federal partnership with CVS and Walgreens um, where CVS and Walgreens chains around the country were um, contracted to do local nursing homes. And so our nursing homes were able to get their vaccines through that federal partnership. And then hospitals and federally qualified health healthcare centers are also receiving vaccine. Um, and then other retail pharmacies such as Walmart is receiving vaccine. So um, these are other places in the community that people may hear about that vaccine is available. Um, I think everyone has their own process of how you get on a wait list or how you schedule a, a, um, 
a vaccine appointment. And, you know, it's our hope. And I know I've been talking to a lot of our primary care physicians. They want vaccine in their offices so that they can provide that service to their own patients. Um, and I'm not sure of the timeline of when that is going to be available, but that is in the plans um, that vaccine will come to, to local doctor's offices, too. Okay, here's Greg Meekins asking, is the health department the clearinghouse for all vaccines to the county? It sounds like no, according to what you were just saying. And what's the protocol for distribution to primary care physician offices, other facilities, pharmacies, Walmart, et cetera? Yeah, is, there, is there sort of an understood uh, pipeline? Well, while I would like to be the clearinghouse, Greg, we're not the clearinghouse. We get doses specifically designed for public health coming to us. Physicians, it's at some point uh, will be asked to register in a system with the state uh, to get their own vaccine. Uh, as health officer, we I want to see the bigger picture though. We'll get data on that, but I'm not as we used to do in our school system with the mental health. I'm not the clearinghouse at this point. Uh, for instance, uh, we're talking. Dr. Scott's talking to Walmart now because they do have vaccine. Uh, stressing that they should be vaccinating the individuals in 1C, 75 years of age and older, and anybody in the 1A, the healthcare workers and others that didn't did not uh, get their vac vaccine uh, at this point. So, I love the idea, but right now we don't we don't have it. Although we, Dr. Scott has developed a great relationship with our private docs, and we'll have a good sense about what they're doing, along with it, if an independent pharmacy was to get the vaccine, I think we'd have better control there. And we're working very diligently with with Walmart because we run into one hiccup with what they're doing already. So, as the health officer, having responsibility for the total population of Dorchester County, I'm interested in that, and we'll try to do exactly what you're saying, Greg, but I don't have total control over, control over it. It's good to hear from Greg. He's one of my partners and I'd say, oh, I'd say crime, I guess not, but uh, when he was <laughs> in the school system. Uh, miss you, Greg. Those records are sealed by the courts, right? <laughs> All right. Good Here's partner. Mary Ellen Jessian. Uh, she says, I get no answer when I call the health department about getting vaccinated, but I've never, so I've never gotten anyone. What gives? Hmm. Well, that's exactly busy vaccinating people. <laughs> well, uh, it, it could be that, you know, we, we only have so many trunk lines coming in and we're trying to address that now. If you have a lot of activity coming through, you may get a busy signal. Uh, so we're trying to deal with that. And I was going to thought about that early to bring that up. If you don't get through the first time, actually, some people have gotten a hold of my cell phone. I won't tell them where they got it from. And they've called me as the health department periodically. So we're there to, we want you to get to a voice. Sometimes we're not able to, to get to you because of the way the system's designed and we are working on it. We don't have a solution yet. Uh, we're exploring some, to see if there's another way to add some trunk lines. Uh, uh, we do have some funding that can help us with that. So that is a, an issue. And, and I think, that, I believe that in our JIC reports and Angela Grove, who's monitoring tonight, we tried to get uh, that type of messaging out to the community as well. So. Uh, we do have, we, we staffed up our call center for that very reason. We brought some additional staff in that were teleworking and working in other areas. We were able to pull staff and the beauty of, of the senior team that I have at the health department, they work as a team, the very little guidance from me because they see an issue and it's something that needs to be dealt with and they deal with it. And so uh, this is one of those, uh, and I don't know, Dr. Scott, I think the call center is working fairly well, but if you can't get through the main number, that's the problem. And I don't have direct dial numbers. And even if you got direct dial numbers into that area, it would impact because there's only so much capacity coming in. Yeah, I think that we, we know that's a problem and we are working to address yeah. it. So I appreciate that you brought that up here. Um, I think the we were able to develop a call center to handle the amount of calls that we're getting about vaccine. And what we're trying to do is um, have a place to transfer those calls to so that the main line can sort of be that operator line. Um, and there just are some limitations to that. So we're working on it. We know we need to do better. All right. Well, I think everybody appreciates, uh, hopefully appreciates just uh, how tiny the staff is there and that you're doing all of this, uh, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it, it's got to be crazy behind the scenes. So uh, Stephanie Alexander asked, when will we be getting more vaccines? Well, I, that's a, I'd say the $64,000 question. Uh, 
the governor is it, it depends, he's been pressing he's wor working with and talking with the uh, president's team uh president made an announcement yesterday about increasing the supplies that are available for the states and a certain percentage that it they were going to put in place he's ordered another i think a certain number of doses i forget the number dr scott today i was reading and that's your supply that that's the supply chain if that supply chain increases uh from the federal government uh, down to the state then our then our our numbers will go up as well so uh, when that will occur, we're not sure. Uh, a lot depends on our new administration and the federal level and how they are able to put together. And I think he has used the Defense Act to increase increase the production. So uh, I wish I had a date to give you folks in, in the community, but we don't know now. Just bear with us. We'll try to be, a, we will be transparent. We'll keep you informed uh, through various means with the community, let, trying to let you know where we are in the process of getting vaccines. I know that the team of vaccinators is led by Dr. Scott. We're ready to rock and roll and they can roll. How many did you say per day you think you do, Dr. Scott? We could easily do 500 a day. So, okay. I, but I, to full transparency, um, you know, when, when we, we get our notification of how many vaccines we're going to get on a weekly basis, um, but we might not know until Friday um, or even Saturday, Saturday of the weekend how many vaccines we're getting for that next week. Um, and so it really makes planning a, a, a challenge. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to cause a, the least amount of disruption to people's schedules. So um, we've had to halt scheduling new appointments simply because we're not sure how much vaccine we're going to get next week, even today. Okay. Well, we're running out of time in the hour here. Uh, let's see if we've got uh, maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Here's Drew Shecker. How many type one diabetes are being prioritized? The state health department and the CDC only specify type two. Well, Dr. Scott. I would classify type one diabetics uh, in the same as type two diabetics. Um, we have a little bit of local flexibility in how we're able to, to address those issues. And so I, I would say diabetes as a disease would be treated the same type one or type two. So is that a, uh, a 1B uh, group? Um, well, I know that was one of the more recent groups that was expanded upon. Right. Um, but here, here's one. where we run into issues with supply. So although we're hearing from the governor's office that everyone is eligible now in these groups, um, right. we're still being told to prioritize 75 and up. Okay. So, you know, I think this is where a lot of frustration happens. And I can certainly understand that because we're hearing that we're eligible and we want to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, but when we only are getting a couple hundred doses yeah. per week and we have a few thousand seniors to vaccinate, that's kind of where, where it's going. Yeah. And also our education partners. That's also been a, a recent directive. So patience and masking are still the uh, watchwords, right? Okay, maybe the last question. Nancy Shockley says, my daughter's a teacher in her second trimester of pregnancy and has asthma. Is there any guidance on getting a vaccine for her or not? So this is a great example of when you should mm -hmm. speak with your personal health care provider, specifically yeah. her OBGYN, yeah. um, about any particular um, concerns that they might have about the vaccine. Yeah. Um, certainly someone who has asthma is considered to be of higher risk of getting um, of complications from a COVID infection. Um, so having asthma is not a contraindication. Um, but here's where the data gets sticky. You know, they did not study the vaccine. Yeah in pregnant women or breastfeeding women. Um, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of pregnant and breastfeeding women that have come through and been vaccinated. I'm seeing a lot of my um, physician friends on Facebook who are pregnant or nursing who are getting vaccinated. So that is a personal choice, but I think it should be discussed with um, the monitoring physician. So in this case, the OBGYN. Okay, I should probably uh, give you folks a chance to make any closing comments and then I'll, I'll have to tie the ribbons on this hour. Where did the time go? <laughs> I don't know what you did with this hour. I think you took some time out of it. Uh, uh, anyway, thanks again to WHCP. And it's great. I'm sitting here in the Michener studio, which has to me a lot of history because he wrote the Chesapeake and has a lot of history there. Uh, I want to thank the community for their support. We ask that you be honest with us as we're trying to be honest with you. 
uh, when it comes to seeking your, your vaccine, we're not asking for a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, I would imply that uh, one should always follow my rotary motto, the four-way test that we practice in rotary. Rotary, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships and will it be beneficial to all concerned? If you practice that, we're in this together. We'll work together. This community has always been very supportive to us and we want to be supportive back to you and be as transparent. So we stand available to, I will not give out my cell phone tonight to folks. <laughs> there are certain folks in the community that do have it and they do call me and I appreciate that. So we thank this community again for their support and what they're doing. Continue to wear your face coverings, social distance, good hand hygiene. And if you get your vaccine, still do all of that because as Dr. Scott said earlier, that still needs to be done. Uh, with that, I'll go back to my real, my real leader on the, on the medical side that keeps me straight. And that's Dr. Scott. So I, I agree with everything you just said, Roger. I think um, I, I want to thank our health department team who is working long, endless hours behind the scenes. Um, and I just, I, I know it's frustrating. I know this is a, a, a time of high anxiety. Um, we're anxious to get the vaccine to you. You are anxious to get the vaccine. Um, as much patience as you can give us, we would certainly appreciate. We're doing everything we can to make sure that it's it's distributed equitably, um, but also in a very timely fashion. So um, I, I appreciate your support and, and encouragement through this whole this whole 10 month thing we've been through. It certainly is one heck of a way to learn about public health. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, in addition to appreciating you guys for all the hard work you're doing, um, Dr. Casey Scott and Roger Harrell, we want to give thanks tonight to Angela Grove, the public information officer for the Dorchester County Health Department, who's been our question analyst for the evening. And uh, Dr. Pete Doyle, who prepared a lot of these questions uh, in advance. And for those of you with unanswered questions, keep checking the health department's website for the latest information on testing and vaccinations, dorchesterhealth.org. If you type that into your search bar, it'll pop right up. And uh, they've got a great Facebook page as well. Now, this broadcast will be repeated this Sunday at 1 p.m. here on 1015. And the webcast, of course, will be available for your viewing pleasure afterwards at both Facebook and YouTube. Now, in two weeks, on Wednesday, February the 10th, again at 7 p.m., we will get an update from the Cambridge Waterfront Development Initiative folks, including the results of the community survey that they have been sponsoring in the field for many weeks, as well as a great video about the importance of preserving community heritage in uh, local development projects. So finally, our thanks tonight to our technical staff engineer in charge, Douglas Schutz, and technical director for tonight's show, Julian Jackson, who is always our technical director. That's why he's at the helm there. So on behalf of the Cambridge Community Conversation Partners, I'm Mike Starling. Stay safe and good evening. Here, here.